please stand. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It is a privilege to approach God's throne and bring him all our prayer requests. He knows all we go through and he is willing to intervene in a mighty way. Let's continue pray for all the people whose names are in the bulletin we had 42 people here in the bulletin, and please continue to pray for them. Also, we had another request. I read these names. Noel Echeverria, Margaret Wilbur, Carol Huber. Um, please also pray for Priscilla. She is in surgery recovery. And also, please pray for Clay Kylin. So, um, I would like to join me to pray here at the front, O'Neill, where you are. You want us to sing it? Father, we come before you asking you to please take our hearts. Lord, please heal us, help us, and bless us. Your word tells us that nothing is impossible to you, and because of that, we bring you our prayer request. Take them, and Father, Please answer them. Please, God of heaven, you know what everyone is going through. Please, Lord, show us your power. Intervening in every circumstance we are facing. Thank you for always listening to our prayers and for answering each of them. In Jesus Christ. We pray, amen.
Happy Sabbath. I hope everyone had a very happy Thanksgiving. Did you eat too much? I know I did. Two days in a row. I'm lucky because uh, at, at my uncle's, you know, he creates, he has this big Thanksgiving spread that he makes, and we eat that. And then the day after, on Friday, we do Thanksgiving with my wife's side of her family. So I get to eat all I want two days in a row, and it's awesome. I love it. I'm very thankful for that. But I hope you all had a very happy Thanksgiving. And it is kind of tradition uh, around the Thanksgiving season as we are being thankful and celebrating what we are so blessed to have. We sing, we gather together. It's hymn number 008. Please join us in singing. We gather together to last the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppress he now sees from distressing see praises to his name he forgets not his own he signed us to guide us our god with us joining second praise song the sabbath is he hideth my soul it's hymn number 520 
out there and all faces. Thank you guys for celebrating a Thanksgiving weekend with us. I hope everybody had good tofu turkeys out there. We come here on the Sabbath day to recognize that God is our creator. And we pay our tithe to recognize that God is our supplier. But just like the Sabbath day, we do not leave here and forget about God. We go home the rest of the week, we pray, we read our Bibles, and we minister to others. Just like our tithe, we also want to give offerings to support other groups, missionaries, 
the poor people, but most important, our youth. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a teenager and growing up, I felt like an outcast in the world. And I don't know how many of our youth feel like outcasts in the world because we're not like the world. Can I hear amen? Thank you. And I don't want our youth to be left as outcasts. So our offering is for the youth ministries. And youth ministries is to support programs for the Pathfinders and for Nosoka Pines. So if you guys can reach deep for our youth ministry to support our youth so they can get together and feel welcome in our church and to help bring those other youth out there to introduce them to our church. Let's have a word of prayer. Oh, gracious Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much for blessing us, for blessing this church, for giving us your truth. May you bless us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us and watch over us. May you lead us and direct us in the sweet name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I know, wasn't that beautiful? Can we all thank Danny for that beautiful song? Yeah. Guess what time it is? All right, little boys and girls, go in the back and get some baskets. It's time for children's story.
Well, good morning, everybody. I don't have quite the story you're used to this morning. This one involves each one of you. First of all, let me see your hands. Both hands. I only have one available. Oh, that's good. Now turn them around so you can look at them. Okay, now look at them. There's something special there. You see all those cracks and crevices? All those lines? Now, some of them are really big, aren't they? The ones in your palm. But look at the little ones on your fingertips. Yeah, those are the ones. They're special. They're very small. Do you know that everyone has different lines on their fingers and their hands? They're not the same. No one has different. Yeah, God made them all different. And some people say, well, identical twins. Yeah, identical twins look alike, but the lines on their fingertips are all different. In fact, Jesus did a wonderful thing. He made each one of us different from somebody else. Turn and look at the people on the step. Do you see anybody that looks like you? Maybe there's somebody out there that looks like somebody else. No, that's right. Everybody out there looks like somebody else. Jesus made us all special so that we could be we could be different and he could love us separately. And he did a very good job, you know, because we don't have brothers or sisters or moms or dads that look like us. We're all by ourselves something special. You'll hear me say that word a lot because Jesus loves us that way. And he did it on purpose. You know, he made all the people in the whole world, each one different. And then he went and he made animals and trees. And I was thinking he made bugs. Do you know how many bugs he made? But all the people he made different so he could love us separately. I think that's just so wonderful that he would do that for each of us. And he wants to pay attention to everything you do and where you go, he cares, and I hope you care about him as well. Let's bow our heads, okay? Lord, we thank you for making each one of us special, something that makes us unique, and we know that you love us since you have done that. Please bless us this morning. Help us to be our best ever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Okay, you can go back to your seats now. Thank you. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in Matthew 25, 48. 548. Matthew 548. It reads, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Happy Sabbath.
Everybody have a good Sabbath? Amen. Good. Everybody have a good week? Amen. Amen. Um, you know, I always, I always feel bad when we have a long, beautiful song service like that, and then you have to hear me speak for two hours. I only have 200 slides, so we'll try to make it go quick. Okay, I hope you all don't mind. Um, no, but I'm glad to see you all this morning. I'm glad that I get a chance to study with you this morning. If you don't mind, I'm gonna, just going to kneel and pray. Uh, I'm going to selfishly pray for myself. As I, as I study the Bible with you here this morning, but I ask if all of you would join me and pray for me. Does that make sense? Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, I ask and pray that you will cleanse my heart and my mind of, of myself, Lord, and I ask and pray that your spirit would be in me and that your word would be lifted up this morning, Lord. I ask and pray that all of us would be able to study your word together, that all of us would study with an open mind and a cleansed heart, Lord. All of us this week have struggled with something. We've all had a challenge this week, Lord, but yet you have brought us all here. You've brought us here to be filled with your word, to be filled with your spirit. You've brought us here, Lord, to take a break from the world. And we all. And I ask and pray this morning, Lord, that all of us would put down our phones and pick up our Bibles. I ask and pray this morning, Lord, that all of us would set ourselves aside, set the world aside, and focus on you on this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord, and help us all to study together so that we may leave this church enlightened and filled with your goodness and your glory, that we may show others the wonderful miracle that you've done for all of us, Lord, in saving us and bringing us here, Lord. Help us to share that miracle of life with all those that we come across. This is my prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, want to, um, I want to bring you to a story this morning. Um, the title of our message is called Accountability and Responsibility, and I feel that this is something that in today's day and age a lot of us lack in the world. I want to bring you to a, a story of our first parents. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. By the way, while you turn there, um, I am from New York. I have a tendency to talk fast once I get going. Once I get passionate about something, it just starts coming out. So there may be some verses that I say too quick for you to turn to. Just jot them down and we'll talk about them later. Um, I also cheat because I have notes that have the verses that I want to bring up. Um, so Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 9. Uh, I, I have my wife back there controlling some slides because we're going to read some, uh, some other quotes and things that I'll have up there so that you don't have to turn to them uh, as quickly. But Genesis chapter 3, this is talking about the, the fall of our first parents. This is where Adam and Eve have, have essentially disobeyed God for the very first time. In verse 9, God is walking in the, in the garden, and in verse 9 he says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Or where art thou? Did God know where Adam was? Yeah. yeah. But he still calls to Adam, and he says, where art thou? And Adam comes out, and he says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, does God know what Adam and Eve have done? Yeah. Does God know each and every one of our struggles? Does God know every mistake that every one of us has made? Yeah. It's interesting that God knows exactly what's happened. He knows the outcome of what's happened. He knows the result of what happened, yet he still goes to Adam and he says, where are you? Adam comes out and he says that he was afraid. God asks him further, he says, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And Adam says, yes, Lord, I did it. I'm guilty. It's all my fault. Is that what Adam says? No. What does Adam say? And the man said, the woman that thou gavest to me, or to be with me, she gave me the tree, and I ate. So what is, what is the very first thing that Adam does? He blames someone. He doesn't admit what he's done. He doesn't say, yes, Lord, I ate the tree, and leave it there. No, what does he say? He says, the woman that, by the way, you gave to me. In other words, if you didn't give me the woman, this would never have happened. But the woman that you gave me, gave me of the tree, and I ate, and I ate. Adam takes no responsibility for his own decision. By the way, did Eve tackle Adam in the garden and shove the fruit in his face and say, here, eat this? No, right? Adam made his own decision to take the fruit from Eve's hand, put it to his own lips, put it in his mouth, and take a bite. Yes or no? Adam made his own decision, right? But yet he blames God for his own decision. He says, well, you're the one that made the fruit. You're the one that made the tree. You're the one that put the woman in the garden. It's your fault. It's not mine. God turns to Eve, hoping that Eve may have a better response. And the Lord said unto Eve in verse 13, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. In other words, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. Now, what she's saying isn't a lie, because the serpent tricked her, right? But does she say, Yes, Lord, I made a mistake. I listened to the serpent, and I ate? No. She says, It's the serpent's fault. 
I will submit to you that the same mistake that Adam and Eve made in the garden <clears throat> by blaming God and blaming one another is the same mistake that we make today. And that we blame God for our own decisions of sin. I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself here, but I want everybody here to listen very carefully because we're going to study this out together. It is not God's fault that you made a choice to watch that program on TV. God did not have the remote control. You did. It is not God's fault that you chose to have that sin in your life or that you chose to fall into whatever temptation that is. That is not God's fault. That is your fault. That is my fault for making the decision. God has given us the strength to overcome. He's given us the wisdom to overcome. There is not a single problem in your life that is not answered in this book that I'm holding. It is not God's fault that we make a decision to put this down and turn to something else. That's our fault. But yet somehow, for some reason, we continually go back to God and we say, Lord, give me more strength. How much more can God give us that he has not already given us? If we read and study our Bibles, all of heaven was poured out in one gift. What was that gift? Jesus Christ. He allowed his only son to come and live as one of us. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Is heaven anything like this world? No. But he allowed his son to leave that. For the very first time in the history of the universe... Jesus was separated from his father, and he willingly did that to come down here to live as you and me, for us to mock him, spit on him, beat him, make fun of him, and ultimately kill him. And he did that so that we would have an opportunity to be saved, that we would have an opportunity to make it back into that heavenly glory that God originally created for us. What more can God give you that he hasn't already given you? What more can he give me that he hasn't already given me? And so I want you to stay to the end because I'm going to say certain things here. This topic is a deep topic. It's like a chicken versus the egg, right? Which one came first, right? And you know, you understand that I, I know the chicken came first because God created the chicken first. I always got to be clear. But you understand the concept, right? I'm going to say one thing at one point that may not make a lot of sense, that may, may be seemingly uh, showing that we can do everything on our own strength, but I'm not. I want you to stay to the end and listen to the whole message. Is that fair? Okay. Because I know sometimes I've, I've, I've preached this sometimes before and people will say no but that's not true we can't do it without Jesus yes you're absolutely right let me get there okay before you stand up and walk out all right um, we need to stop thinking that it's God's fault and what we do is we make excuses we take things out of context as an excuse for example turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3 verse 23 Romans 3 verse 23 we're not going to turn to all of these scriptures uh, but this one I want you to read for yourself because I want you to understand something very clearly Romans chapter 3, verse 23. <clears throat> There's no sound in the world more beautiful than people turning the pages in their Bibles. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Paul says, for all are sinners and continue to sin. Is that what he says? No. He says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, have all of us fallen short of the glory of God? Yeah. But what's the specific word that he used there? He says, for all have what? Sin. Did he say, does he say, for all are sinners? See, punctuation is important. Grammar is important. Understanding the correct meanings of words is important. Paul does not say, for all are sinners. He doesn't say that. Paul doesn't say, for all continue to sin. He doesn't say that. He says, for all have sinned. That's past tense. That's in your past. Now, how many of you have made a mistake in your past? All of us, right? There's not a single person here that has not made a mistake. But Paul doesn't say that we continue in those sins. Paul doesn't say that we continue living that same life. He says, for all have made a mistake. Be comforted in that. We've all made a mistake. We've all, we've all gone astray. But we don't continue to go astray. Jesus doesn't go looking for the lost sheep and then leave the sheep lost. Jesus doesn't go looking for the lost sheep and say, oh, good. I found that he's in the field over there. I'm going to leave it there. He goes and he gets the lost sheep. And what does he do with it? He brings it back. He brings it back out of its lost state, back into the fold where it belongs. For all have sinned. It's past tense. But we take that as saying, oh, well, all have sinned. I'm okay. It's okay that I make a mistake. It is okay to a certain extent. It's not okay that we keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over again and go back to God as if he's a revolving door that'll just keep forgiving the same sin over and over again and everything is just hunky-dory. 
That's not how it works. Jesus himself said, Matthew 5.48, our scripture, he said, it, he said it on the Sermon on the Mount after he had just explained all of these different characteristics that he wanted his people to have. I suggest you go read Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and, and, and chapter, read the whole book. But he had just explained exactly how he wanted his people to act. And he said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I don't know about your Jesus. My Jesus isn't a liar. My Jesus doesn't ask me to do something that's impossible. My Jesus doesn't, doesn't put an impossible task at my feet and then say, good luck, and walk away. Jesus doesn't just abandon me on this earth and say, well, good luck with that. If you make it to heaven, cool. If not, sorry about your luck. And he goes and he sits back up there on his throne. That's not how it works either. Jesus says, be ye perfect, and I'm going to help you with every aspect of that. And I'm going to make sure that you're perfect. But we have a decision to make. That decision is ours. Jesus says, take my hand, and I will make you perfect. And then he stands there with his hands outstretched. You have to decide to take your hand out of your pocket and take his hand. And then when he walks this way, you have to make a decision to go in the same direction that he walks. This is from, uh, by the way, I'm going to read from a number of different Bible commentaries. I love Bible commentaries because they have a beautiful way of explaining things in a different, uh, from a different context. This one is from Our Father Cares. I think that's the first slide that I have up there. Yep, Our Father Cares. What does God require? By the way, I'm going to read them from here. I have a lot of commentaries here behind me. I want you guys to read them up there because you won't have the book, and I want you to read it for yourself. Anyway, what does God require? What's it say? Perfection. Nothing less than perfection. But does that mean he abandons us to just do it ourselves? No. Uh, I'm going to read from a book. There's a wonderful book called, and i got to find it because you know, if any of you know me well, you know I have four million books in the bag. This is from Christ Object Lessons. If you ever want to understand some of the lessons that Christ taught, this is one of the best books. This commentary breaks down all of the different lessons that he taught and breaks it down in just ways that, again, I don't want to say simpler than the Bible. The Bible is super simple, but some of us, some of us sometimes we get too mixed up in worldly things that we can't even understand the Bible, and so sometimes reading commentaries is helpful. This is from Christ Object Lessons, page 330. I want you to read this up here. And I want you to think about it. God will accept only those who are determined to aim high. How high is your determination this morning? Are you determined to live a mediocre Christian life or not? The decision's yours. He places every human agent under obligation to do his best. Doesn't say mediocre. Moral perfection is required of all. Never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate inherited or cultivated tendencies of wrongdoing. How many of you have inherited tendencies that are not the best? I praise the Lord that some of you have raised your hands and it's not just me. But there's no excuse for that. There's no, we should never lower the standard of God, essentially saying that our devil is stronger than our God in order to let those tendencies continue. We need to understand that imperfection of character is a sin. Did Jesus have a perfect character? Yes. Is he our example or not? Yes. All righteous attributes of character dwell in God as, perfect, in a, as a perfect, harmonious whole. And everyone who receives Christ as a personal Savior is privileged to those attributes. I want you to take that in for a second. Are you a follower of Christ? Amen. Yeah. So are you, do you have access to his perfect character? Yeah, do you have access to his perfect attributes? So why do we keep on having the inherited tendencies? That why, why are we so forceful in keeping the sin that we have when we have access to the giver of life and the giver of truth and the perfect character? That's like saying I have access to the most healthy, beautiful, wonderful food in the world, but I'm going to McDonald's instead. By the way, no offense to anybody who eats at McDonald's. That wasn't my, my goal. I don't like McDonald's. That's why I picked it. Uh... And those who would be workers together with God must strive for perfection of every organ of the body and quality of mind. I, 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 I can't make, you know, Jesus taught these things. I'm going to skip now to uh, page 331, just the other page. Listen carefully. But Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. How many of you have struggled with something in life? Keep raising your hands. By the way, it might... I like shoulder workouts, right? How many of us have struggled? All of us, right? Not one of us has had an easy life, and all of us has had a, a difficult time in something, some way or another. Every single one of us is different in every single way. 
And obtaining that Christian character is not easy, but it's not impossible. You see, the devil had this lie that God's law was too hard to keep. You can't keep it. We as Christians, we repeat the lie of the devil because we'd rather be sinful and say God's law is too hard. I can't keep it. I can't be a good person. God's law is too hard. So we would rather preach the message of the devil than the message of Christ who says, I can save you. My law is not too hard. I can give you the strength and everything you need and I can save you. Just trust me and follow me. We sang a hymn this morning, trust in what? Obey. obey. God doesn't ask us to obey because he's just a, a king that expects obedience, right? God says, look, I know that you live in a sinful world. I know that this is a tough time and I can help you, but you have to follow me. You have to do the things I say because I tell you to do them for a reason. Let me continue. A noble all-around character is not inherited. It does not come to us by accident. A noble character is earned. Is earned. How do you earn something? How do you guys earn six-pack abs? You just wake up in the morning and they're there? Is that how it works? <laughs> I appreciate those of you that are nodding your head. Yes, I really wish that, that's the way it works. In fact, sometimes they joke around that I can't wait to get heaven so I can finally have abs. That's, that's you know... Um, a noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. I don't want you to miss that. Our character, a noble character, is earned through Christ. It's like, you want abs? You got to eat right? You got to go to the gym. You want to bench press 225? You're not going to do it by sitting on the couch eating a Snickers bar. You got to go to the gym. You got to start doing push-ups. You got to put in the effort. You got to start putting in the exercise. And then those things will happen. Does that make sense? It is formed by hard, stern battles with self. Conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary tendencies. We shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not one unfavorable trait to remain uncorrected. How many unfavorable traits? Not one. It takes a little bit of soul searching. That's what my father used to say. When I was failing out of school or I was doing something wrong or I was getting in trouble, my father would say, you better do some soul searching there, kid, and figure out what you want to do in life. It's the same thing as a Christian. Let no one say, listen carefully, let no one say that I cannot remedy my defects of character. How many of you have thought that or said that? How many of you have thought that, well, I, 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 can't, I can't do this, I can't remedy my character? We teach the same lie in the church today, that, oh, we're just going to be sinners forever. Friends, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus is coming to, to get sinners. Why was Satan kicked out of heaven? Because of what? Sin, his iniquity. So if God kicked Satan out of heaven because of his sin, what makes you think he's going to let you in with it? If you come to this decision, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. So I have a question. Have you submitted to the will of God? You know, in Hebrews, I'm going to read a hard verse here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you, but you're going to know it once I read it. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. That's a deep verse. Sometimes as Christians, we like to ignore verses like this because it's hard. Because it cuts us to the core. It cuts us on our hearts and we say, oh Lord, that can't be. I can just go back to you and repent again and again and again and you're just this revolving door of grace where I can just keep sinning, keep breaking the law and it's no problem. Friends, it's much more serious than that. God can't help you if you're making a choice to live a completely separate life. All through the Bible, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites decided to live a life separate from God, and they allowed idolatry in their lives, and they allowed all these things to come into their lives, what happened to them? Bless you. Was it, was it good or was it bad? What was the outcome? It was always bad, right? Because they decided to live a life separate from God. Paul isn't saying that, look, you can never be forgiven if you sin willfully. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that if you decide to live a life of sin and you decide to live out there in the world and you decide to continually, you know, go back to God as that revolving door with no true repentance whatsoever, there's little that God can do for you because you haven't turned from your wicked ways. I'm going to read some of those quotes to you in a minute. So I, I hope you don't, again, stay till the end. Don't just take what I'm saying right now. And it's, again, chicken versus the egg. But we have a choice to make. 
We have a decision to make, and it's a hard decision. It's a hard decision because deep down inside, what do we prefer? We prefer sin, whatever that is. You know, sometimes I go to an extreme, and, you know, we talk about drinking and smoking. But, you know, it's interesting because even in the church, those are very, very big sins that are prevalent even in the church. You know how many times I've preached to Adventists and I've had them, uh, or any Christian, and I've had them take me aside and say, you know, I'm really struggling with smoking. I don't tell anybody in the church because they would shun me, but I'm really struggling with it. You know, I'm really struggling with drinking. You know, my parents were an alcoholic, whatever it may be, and they struggle with alcohol. Just because somebody's sitting in this pew right now doesn't mean they're not struggling with these things. You know, Jesus also talked about our character. You know, he talked about hating our brother and our sister. You know, many of us don't struggle with smoking and drinking and all those other things that we would expect out in the world, but we hate people that sit here in church. That's the same thing. I hate to tell you this, but he who breaks one is guilty of how much? All. So you may not be guilty of smoking and drinking, but you're hating your brother that's sitting next to you in the same pew. Guess what? You're all going to be in the same place with those who are drinking and smoking. So don't condemn one without looking at your own heart and saying, I'm going to be in the same place. It's all the same. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does he say? You all know it. God forbid, he says. Should we continue in sin? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So I have a question for you. Are you dead to sin? Yes or no? I have a question for me when I look in the mirror in the morning. Am I dead to sin? Yes or no? It's like going to an AA meeting, right? No one can help you unless you admit you have a what? A problem. You got to admit that you're not where you need to be in order to fix the problem, right? But a lot of us, we make up excuses. You say, well, all have sinned. It's okay. Everybody else, we're all the same. It's fine. It doesn't work that way. If I know that I'm living in sin, I got to bring that to God. I got to make a decision to stop. Because someday, Revelation 22, verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. There's coming a time, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, when Michael shall stand up, that great prince which stands for his people. And at that day, it's done. It's finished. Probation closes. There's no more hope. There's no more anything for us. If we've chosen to live a life of sin, then at that moment, our life of sin is sealed. Period. If we've chosen to live a life of filthiness and wickedness, at that moment, it's sealed. Period. There's nothing else I can do. When the ark was sealed, how many after the ark was sealed wanted to get in? Everybody. But could they get in? No. Because God had closed the ark. God had said, this is finished. If I allow this to go on for another thousand years, then this will go on for another thousand years. It's finished. But I have good news for you. Because the rest of the verse says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Listen, friends, brothers and sisters, you and me have access. We have access to holiness. We have access to righteousness. We have access to perfection. We have access to never, ever hurt again, never to cry again. Every single one of us in this room can be with our loved ones for the rest of eternity, never, ever to be separated ever again. We have the ability to, to, to fly through the cosmos together. We have the ability to see the things that God has created with our very eyes. We have the ability to look at these galaxies that today we can only look through pictures. We can see them. We can touch them. We can be there with God for an eternity. He that is holy, let him be holy still. But the decision is ours to live that life or not. It's not on God. God says, look. I've told you what's good and I've told you what's bad. Can God interfere with our free will? Can God force us to accept him and love him? Can God force us to put down whatever it is that we know is bad? He can't. He won't because he wants you to make the decision out of love. If I love my wife, am I going to go around with other women? No. If you love your husband, are you going to go around with other men? No, because that's not love. But is my wife going to force me? I mean, how do you think my wife would feel if she had to say, listen, it really bothers me when you go out on dates with other women. I really prefer that you stop that. And you really think I'm going to say, yeah, honey, it's a real struggle, but I'll do, it my, I'll do my best. What kind of a marriage do you think I would have? Probably not a good one, right? God is the same thing, friends. I'm going to read something here. This is a, if you're, 
if you, uh, if you want some guidance on your home, if you're struggling with how you should operate your home, there's a wonderful commentary, Adventist Home, and uh, it takes all the Bible verses throughout the Bible, and it talks about, gives some guidance on how we should operate our home, how fathers should be, how husbands should be, how wives should be. It's a great book. I'm going to read this to you, though, because this is one of my favorite quotes. Adventist Home, page 16. Right slide? Yeah. If you have become estranged and have failed to be Bible Christians, keep going in your failure. Do you, do you think that's what it says? Is that what it says up there? No. It says be what? Converted. What does it mean to be converted? If I have a gas engine truck and I take the gas engine out and I put in a diesel engine, is it the same motor? No. Does it operate the same? No. Doesn't even run on the same fuel. It's a different motor, right? Be converted. Be changed. Be different. If you have failed, don't stay in your failure. Be converted. Now listen carefully to this. For the character you bear in probationary time, which is now, will be the character that you will have at the coming of Christ. Now I want to ask you something. I don't want you to raise your hands because I'm certainly not going to raise my hand. I want you to... Do some soul searching here for a second and think to yourself, if Jesus came in the clouds of glory right now, if this was our last sermon together, if this was our last moment on this earth, would you leave that pew and fly up to meet Jesus in the air to ever be with Jesus? That's a deep question. I, know what you, I don't know what you did last night, but you do. I don't know how your morning was, but you do. I don't know how your week was, but you do. Ask yourself that. Let me ask you a question. I'll read the rest of the quote in a minute, but I'll ask a question. Okay. Let's just say right now we're in this church. And let's just say that out of these vents on both sides of the church, jet black smoke starts pouring out of the church. And you know that it's burning. You know that the church is on fire. How many of you are going to just sit in those pews acting like everything is just fine? Show your hands. Okay. How many of you would get up and walk to an exit, probably hastily take your family and say, hey, we're going to go to one of these exits. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there ways out of the sanctuary? Yeah, they're posted with these bright big exit signs, right? So that in the case of an emergency, we know where to go and we know how to leave, right? Okay, now I'm going to ask a question here, and it may sound like I'm being blasphemous, but believe me, I'm not. How many of you would stay in the pew despite the church burning down around you, and you would pray, Lord, send your angels to pick me up and carry me to an exit? How many of you would pray that? Okay. How many of you might say, Lord, help me to get to the exit safely and then get up out of the pew and get to the exit? Okay. Did God provide you with the way out of the sanctuary? Yeah. Did God provide you with legs to get you out of the sanctuary? Now, in the case of my, my dear Debbie here, we may have to help her out. Those of you who don't know, she was in an accident. Or she, she's still healing, so we may have to help her. But God's provided us around her to help get her out, right? Is she on her own? No, because God's given all of us to help her to get out, right? God has made the way for all of us to get out. It's our decision to get up and get out. Does that make sense? And so the character that we have now is the character that we're going to have forever. This is the time to fix your character, not when Jesus comes in. It's too late. That's like trying to get into the ark after the door closed. It doesn't work that way. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. How many of you are ready? Now, I understand, by the way, I'm being a little facetious here. The Bible does also teach that none of us will ever truly be able to raise our hands and say, yep, I'm ready, take me. So I get it, right? I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. We're going to have a struggle for the rest of our time here on earth, right? We're going to be soul searching for the rest of our time here on earth, but that doesn't excuse our sins. I want you to be clear. You must first be a saint on earth. The traits of character that you cherish in life will not be changed by death or the resurrection. If I die as somebody who cherishes, I don't know, certain programs on TV, let's just say I have unclean lips. Think about this in your heads. Do you have unclean lips? Maybe some of us do, maybe some of us don't. I had unclean lips for a very long time. In fact, I could not say a single sentence without a cuss word. Praise God that I'm no longer that way. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. What place is missing? Church. Why? How many people come to church cussing up a storm? Huh? None of us, right? How many people walk into church with a beer and a cigarette? None of us, right? We dress nice. We come to church. We act like we're on our game. And then we do all that stuff and we go home. 
We're not judged based on how we are in church. We're judged based on how we are in home and society. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. So when is the time for us to change? When is the time for us to live a righteous life? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I asked you before, is Jesus our example? Yeah. If Jesus can live that way, and he says, look, I lived a life without sin so that I can give my merits, my qualities, my attributes to you, is it possible for us to live the way that Christ lived? Is it possible for us to help our neighbors? Is it possible for us to let go of our hate, let go of the anger that we have, maybe towards other people, maybe even in the church, and just love people the way that Jesus did? Is it possible? Yeah. I will tell you right now that I was not the person that you see up here 20 years ago. I was nowhere near the person that you see up here. And I hope that 20 years from now, I'm nowhere near the person that you see right now. That's my prayer. Because I'm on a walk with Jesus, and every day Jesus teaches me something new. You know why Jesus teaches me something new? Because I spend time with him, and I learn something new. But JP, that's not possible. J Jesus was perfect. Jesus was God. I, I, can't, I can't be that way. That's a lie. That's a lie that the devil wants you to believe so that you can continue living the life that you live, making excuses every day, so that when the time comes... And he stands and says, it's done. Those who are unjust, let them be unjust. That's a lie of the devil so that you're in the unjust category. Because he wants you to be with him in that lake of fire. He wants you to be with him on the outside of the ark because that's how he hurts God. Jesus not only said in Matthew 5, 48 to be perfect, when he caught the woman in adultery in John chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Did he tell her, it's totally fine, I forgive you. Go and keep doing what you were doing. No. He said, stop. Go and sin no more. <clears throat> I'm going to read a couple quotes now from, from a few. By the way, I like going through different, different books. This book is called Steps to Christ. You ever read Steps to Christ? Show of hands. Anybody read Steps to Christ? It's, it is a good book. This one's upside down, so it's going to be hard to read the quote. This is Steps to Christ, page 39. And again, it'll be up there. Confession, what's confession? Anybody know? Nope. Confession is not repentance, but close. Confession is admitting what I've done, which is not repentance. Have you ever seen a court trial where somebody is guilty of murder and the, the murderer says, yep, I did it. You ever seen something like that happen in there? That's confession. The murderer, the thief says, yep, I did it, but are they sorry? See, that's the real question, right? You can confess your sins all day long. Confession is a piece of repentance, but confession is not repentance. Confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. There must be a decided change in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. Who's holding the TV remote? Is it God or is it me? It's me. Who's sitting in front of the computer? Is it God or is it me? It's me. Who's the one in charge of getting up from the computer and saying, Lord, I'm going to do something bad. I'm going out there to go pray, or I'm going to go out there and read a book, or I'm going to go outside and start chipping wood. I don't care what you do, but you're the one that's in charge of saying, I'm going to get up and go somewhere else because I'm going to sin. I'm going to get this temptation away from me. That's on us. And God will speak to you. God will say, listen, Brother JP, before you go down that hallway, I want you to know that you should make a left. I make the choice to go straight or not. The work, oh, let me finish reading this. This will be the result of genuine sorrow for sin. Do you have a genuine sorrow for your sin or do you play with it? The work that we have to do on our part is plainly set before us. This is from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. I'm going to read this for you. Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings. Isaiah is not saying God is going to wash you and make you clean. He says, you wash you and make you clean. Put away your evil doings before mine eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do well. It's not complicated. Stop doing what's bad. Start doing what's good. We are human beings that have been given the willpower to make a decision. And I'm sorry if I'm harping on the decision point, but again, 
for some reason, we make this excuse that it's all God. We say, God, I made a bad decision again. It's on you. Forgive me. We do the same thing that Adam and Eve did. God, I made a bad decision. I fell into sin again. God, I made a bad decision. I did this. It's your fault because you put the computer in my house. Why didn't you remove the computer? No. Repentance includes a sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. This is from uh, the next slide, I think. There we go. Thank you. Um, repentance includes a sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. So if I'm sorry for my sin, but I keep doing it, does that count? If I confess my sin, but I'm not really sorry that I did it, does that count? No. I will tell you this, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish reading the quote here. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in life. I will tell you this. I'm going to pause here just for a second. I, I, have, I want to give you a quick story. Um, I struggled with addiction for, let's see, from maybe the time I was about 11 or 12 till the time I was in my late 20s, so 20 years or so, give or take. Um, I would say late 20s, like 27, maybe 28. I was an Adventist when I was still struggling with addiction. I won't tell you what, addic what the addiction is. You don't need to know. You just need to know that I struggled with addiction. And I had prayed all the time, Lord, give me this strength to stop. How many of you have had that prayer before? But I didn't stop. Who do you think I blame for that? I blame God. Lord, I did it again. Give me the strength to stop. And I would do it again. And I would say, Lord, I don't understand. Aren't I asking for the strength to stop? Aren't I asking for the strength to put down whatever it is? And I didn't get it. Until one day, I was broken to the point of intense weeping. Have you ever cried so hard that your chest hurts? Have you ever cried so hard that you almost can't catch your breath? I was so broken by my addiction. I was so broken by what I had kept doing, and not only kept doing to my family, but kept doing to God. That's really what broke me, that I dropped to my knees in this intense weeping, and I said, Lord, if I can't beat this, then just kill me now. Because I'd rather, I'd rather not go on living than have to continue with this addiction the rest of my life. I was at that point, not that I would ever take my own life, but I was so broken that I would rather not be living than have to deal with that addiction. That's how broken I was. And in that moment, God finally showed me. He said, this is what you've needed to do all along. Because now you're actually sorry for your sin. You're, now you're truly giving up what it is. And it clicked that this whole time, it had nothing to do with God's strength. It had nothing to do with God's wisdom. God had already given me all of those things. He had already given me the strength to stop. He would already given me the guidance that it was wrong. He gave me everything I needed. What lacked was me. What lacked was my brokenness of heart and my true willingness to let it go, to hate my sin as God hates it. And in that moment, I will tell you, I have never once since that day had any want, passion, thought to continue in those addictions ever again. By God's grace, nothing to do with me. It was God's strength, but all that lacked was my brokenness. And that's what sometimes we forget. We put it all on God and we say, well, Jesus does everything. Jesus doesn't make your choice. This is uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 315. Now, this is talking about professed Christians. And I'm going to read some of these quick because I don't want to keep you all too long. The man who came to the feast without a wedding garment represents the condition of many in our world today. They profess to be Christians. How many of you would call yourself a Christian? Raise your hands. Everybody should raise their hands because we all call ourselves Christians. They profess to be Christian and lay claim to the blessings and privileges of the gospel, yet they feel no need of a transformation of character. They have never felt true repentance for sin. They do not realize their need of Christ or exercise the faith in him. You see, it's a dual thing. You can't just say, well, I'm a Christian, I have faith in God, but then don't exercise the faith. you got to do both. They have not overcome their hereditary or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing, yet they think that they are good enough in themselves, and they rest upon their own merits instead of trusting in Christ. Hearers of the word, they come to the banquet, but they have not put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. So, here's where I'm putting it together for you. Whose strength is it that really gets rid of the sin? 
It's Christ, Jesus Christ. That's the strength that gets rid of it. Who's the one that reveals that what I'm doing is wrong? It's Christ, the Holy Spirit, God. They say, hey, this is wrong in your life. We need to get rid of it. Can I do it by myself? Can I do it on my own? No. But who's the one that's got to make the decision to let that go and then follow Christ in order for Christ's power to work in my life in order to get that sin to go? It's got to be me. Now, there's a couple different things that happen here. Sometimes we openly choose that sin. We know that it's wrong. And we say, yeah, but it's not a big deal. How many of you have ever done that in your life? Yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, that, that one thing that I'm doing. Yeah, I'm not Hitler, right? I'm not, I'm not killing anybody, so it's not bad, right? We like to compare ourselves to each other. We like to say, well, I'm not doing what that person's doing, so I'm a step above. Cool. I hate to tell you this, but that's not how it works. We're going to both be in the same place where sinners go, right? Just because you're a little bit better than the person who sits next to you or you think you're a little bit better doesn't mean that you're any less or more saved. I want to read you something here from the Bible, my favorite book, Job chapter 1, verse 8. For the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? Was there anybody like him on the earth? No. Was Job Jesus? No. I want to prove my point here for a minute that you can live a perfect life, that you, in the eyes of God, can be a perfect man or woman. Notice how I just said man and woman. I didn't say any of the other 67, whatever there are. Job chapter 1, verse 8. He says, there are none like him on the earth, a perfect, what did God say? A perfect and upright man. And then God is nice enough to give you the recipe. He says, one that fears God and shuns evil. Do you fear God this morning? Do you shun evil this morning? How do you choose to live your life? Because Job does those things, and what did God consider him? A perfect and upright man. You know, there was another man in the Bible, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch didn't even get to see death. Enoch just walked with God, and God said, hey, you know what? Let's just go to my house. Let's go to my place. You deserve it. Was Enoch God? Was Enoch Jesus? But yet he lived a righteous enough life for God to say, I'm just going to take you to heaven. I'm going to read something from uh, Last Day Events here. If I can find the book. I have so many. <clears throat> this is another Bible commentary you should get. This particular one takes all the Bible verses uh, that talk about last day events that talk about essentially the end of the world and puts them into uh, kind of like a chain of events, if you will. Uh, wonderful book. Highly recommend it. This is going to be, let's see, last day events, page 71. I'm going to read some of these to you. Enoch walked with God for 300 years previous to his translation to heaven. Most of us struggle walking with God for 30 years. Never mind 300. But Enoch walked with God for 300 years. And I want you to listen to this next statement or read it up here. And the state of the world was not then more favorable for the perfection of a Christian character than it is today. Well, let's turn to, let's turn to, uh, I want to turn to um, 2 Timothy here for a second. You can turn there with me. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. In your Bibles. <clears throat> I'm going to read... Uh, Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Good study so far? I'm hoping that it's pricking, folks. This, this, one, this one cut me pretty deep when I studied it, and I figured, well, you know, our job is to share. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's start in verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. You know... Paul could have just shortened this up by saying 2023. But uh, he wanted to give you the specifics. Without natural affection, truce breakers, uh, false accusers, um, and the list goes on. Traitors, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, the list goes on and on and on. Does it sound like we're living in that age today? But, you know, what's interesting is that in Enoch's time, it was the same. It was the exact same. Why? Well, turn to uh, Genesis chapter, I think, is it 6, 5, I think? 
maybe it's five, six. Let's turn, let's figure it out. Genesis chapter five, where is it, verse six? No, maybe it's six, five. yeah, it's six, five. Sometimes I, I get the dyslexia in action. Genesis chapter six, verse five says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Man had gotten to the point where we were incapable of thinking anything else but evil. We were incapable of any other deed other than evil. That was the time that Enoch was raised in. That was the time that Enoch grew up in. Yet he walked with God for 300 years in that time. What's our excuse? None. None. How did he do it? How did Enoch walk with God? He educated his mind and his heart to ever feel that he was in the presence of God. I want to turn to uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. By the way, just a word to the wise, if you're ever reading any Bible commentary, always compare with what they say with the Bible and say, does this fit? If it doesn't fit, then throw the commentary in the garbage. If it fits, then you can keep it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. Enoch had trained his mind and his heart to know that he had always walked with God, that he was walking with God. He trained his mind and his heart to ever feel that he was in the presence of God. And when in perplexity, his prayers would ascend to God to keep him. I want you to listen to this next, this next two statements. He refused to take any course that would offend his God. He refused. You know, the martyrs refused. There has been characters throughout history that refused to, to bow to kings and they were killed for it. It's a refusal. Every cell, every ounce in your body, I refuse. As a husband, no matter what woman is around me, I refuse to offend my wife. Refusal. Absolutely not. Under no circumstances. That was Enoch's mentality. He had trained himself to understand that he walked with God, that God saw his every action, knew his every thought, and that he was with God and God was with him. And he trained himself to say, you know what, Lord, I refuse to do anything that's going to offend you. I refuse to do anything that's going to push you away from me. I refuse to do anything that is going to separate this walk between you and I. Amen. Why can't we do the same? We can. We choose not to. Is that choice God's fault? Is it, is it the woman that you gave me, she gave me to eat, and so it's your fault because you did it? Is it God's fault? Is it all because the serpent tricked me, and is it all that? No, it's, it's I've chosen to do something to offend you, Lord, that's causing you not to walk with me. The choice is on me. No one else. <clears throat> I think I lost my sermon here. There we go. All right, I got a few more that I want to read to you. This one's from, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm reading so much to you because I want you to understand that I'm not making this up. I'm reading so much to you because I want you to understand that, oh, I hope I brought that one. If I didn't bring it, then we'll have to read it from the slides. I may have left that one home. Hang on, let's see. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Nope, I think we'll have to read it from the slides. All right, the next one. Let's go to the next quote. I, I, I left it at home. John and Judas, actually I can read it from there, right? Yeah. John and Judas are representatives of those who profess to be Christ's followers. So you got two different, two different apostles, right? You got John and Judas. Both these disciples had the same opportunities to study and follow the divine pattern. Yes or no? Did they or did they not? Did they both walk with Jesus? Did they both hear Christ's teachings? Did they both see him heal all the different people he healed? Did they both see him bring back people to life? Yeah, they both had the same opportunities, just like you and I have. Both were closely associated with Jesus and were privileged to listen to his teachings. Go to the, the next one. Each possessed serious defects of character. Were they perfect? No. They possessed defects. And each had access to the divine grace that transforms the character. But while one in humility was learning from Jesus, you see, that's the key. You may not be perfect today, but are you learning from Jesus? Yes or no? You may not be where God wants you, but are you learning from Jesus? Are you walking in the right direction? 
You may not be able to bench press 300 pounds, but are you going to the gym to get in better shape? That's the concept. That's the idea. How many of you, well, don't show your hands. How many of you would like to lose 10 or 15 pounds? Just think that in your, <laughs> some of you were beautiful enough to raise your hands and I thank you for that, right? Are you going to lose it by sitting on the couch? No. Are you going to lose it by eating Snickers bar, watching TV? No, absolutely not, right? If you want to lose weight, you got to eat right, you got to exercise. Can we say amen to that? Okay. Are you learning from Jesus? Yes or no? But while one in humility was learning of Jesus, the other revealed that he was not a doer of the word, but a hearer only. Now listen, I'm not here condemning anybody this morning because we're all in the same church. We're all brothers and sisters together, right? But I don't know about you, but I would love to see in heaven a little, a little section labeled Kernersville Seventh Day Adventist Church where all of us get to reunite. You know, when all this is how I this is this is one of the beautiful visions that I have about heaven. I want to see, you know, this sign that says Kernersville here with an arrow. And that's kind of our gathering place where we all get together and greet each other as we've made it to heaven before we all part ways to fly through the galaxies. And you know what I mean? I want to I want to see a little meeting place where every single one of us get to greet each other and cry with each other and say, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so glad that you made it. But we have to be learning of Jesus. We have to be a doer of the word, not just a listener only. We can't just say these things are sins and I know they're sins, but it's okay because Jesus forgives me. It's not okay. It's not okay. My sins are not okay and neither are yours. They're not okay. It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to be where we are. It's okay to learn from Jesus. It's not okay to stay where we are. Does that make sense? It's okay to be afraid of heights while you're climbing the ladder, but you can't stay on the same rung. You got to climb the ladder. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Uh, what the, the next slide, please. One was daily dying to self and overcoming sin, was sanctified through the truth, the other resisting the transforming power of grace and indulging selfish desires and was brought into bondage of Satan. Friends, I hate to tell listen, how many of you would enjoy being a slave? <clears throat> Don't you realize that's what we are? Don't you realize that we're slaves to our sin and you have direct access to the power that can make you free? You can be free. You can be free to, to, to live in heaven with Jesus and your loved ones forever. You can be free. You can stay in this world and be free from that sin. You can be free from the bondage of whatever it is that's holding you back. You can be free. But you've got to make the choice. Uh, next slide, please. Such transformation of character is as seen in the life of John is ever the result of communion with Christ. And there it is. How many of our jobs get in the way? Even sometimes your family, right? You gotta take the kids to school, you gotta you know, change this one's diaper, you get home from work at six, seven o'clock at night, and you gotta do this, you gotta get dinner ready, you know, pretty soon it's 10 o'clock at night and you're going, I'm exhausted, I gotta get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow to go do this, and to sleep you go, right? How many times does that happen? I'm a dad, I work, I get it. But we need to find that time because the only way that we're gonna get there is by that continual communion with Christ. I met a pastor once that would wake up, and I'm not suggesting anybody do this. I certainly have not gotten there yet. But he would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning just so that he could have that time with Christ before he went on to, to work to do his thing. And I would say to myself, that's such an inspiration for me, that he would get up that early because Christ was that important to him to spend that time with Christ before he would go on with his day. And I need to get there. And I'm willing to admit that I need to get there. But I pray that all of you need to get there, and we'll all get there together. There may be a marked defects in the character of an individual, yet when he becomes a true disciple of Christ, the power of divine grace transforms and sanctifies him. It's the power of Christ that does it all, but you have to take hold of it. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, he is changed from glory to glory until he is like him who he adores. Do you adore Jesus, yes or no? If we adore Jesus, then let's be like him. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. If we adore Jesus, if we follow Jesus, if we claim to be Christians, then let's be Christians. Let's just not be Christians in word and deed. Let's just not judge each other and say, well, I do this and, you know, I do this and he doesn't, so I must be better than him. No. Help your brother. Pick him up when he's down. Let's all get there together. And stop making excuses for what's on us and not God. The, uh, the last quote that I have from you is a quote called, Be Like Jesus. This one I have here, I'm going to read it. I think that should be it, right? Uh, skip to the, 
can go to the next one. I, by the way, my wife is kind enough to, to do the slides for me, so I feel bad because I put her on the spot. So you all pray for her and give, give her thanks later for helping me out. I told her that I lack the mental capacity to read from a book and control the clicker. I'm a man. I have limited capabilities here. Um, be like Jesus, page 337. Their infirmities may be many, and their sins great. Their ignorance seeming unsurmountable. But if they realize their weakness, do we realize our weakness? Yes or no, that's something you've got to ask yourself. I'm weak, I'll admit it. And look to Christ for aid, he will be their efficiency. He will ever ready, he, he is ever ready to enlighten their dullness and overcome their sinfulness. If they avail themselves of his power, their characters will be transformed. They will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and holiness. Through his merits and imparted power, they will be more than conquerors. Supernatural help will be given to them, enabling them in their weakness to the deeds of omnipotence. Friends, do you want to be like Jesus or not? Do we want to be sinless or not? Or do you want to just keep making excuses? Now listen, I already said that that the Bible doesn't teach that we're ever going to be able to stand up there and say, yes, Lord, I'm sinless. But we have to strive for perfection. Every day there's going to be something new that Jesus teaches us. Every day something new is going to come up, but we have to conquer that thing, whatever that is. Jesus gives us encouragement here in John. This is the last verse of the day. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that you may have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulations. Is it going to be easy? No. Are we going to have struggles? Yes. Are there going to be times where we need to be crying to the Lord? Yes. But he says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. There is not a single sin that you need to keep in your life. There is not a single excuse that we have. There is not a single reason why we need to continue to be slaves to the things that are in our life. We make a decision to get rid of them, and Christ promises to help us to get rid of them as long as we break, as long as we get on our knees and we cry and we say, Lord, I hate this sin. Get it out of me. If we don't hate it, God can't do anything with it. But I promise you, friends, that there is no reason to continue to be a slave for sin. There's no excuse to not live the life of Christ. And I'm not standing up here telling you that I'm perfect and I got it all figured out. This is more a study for me than you. An old pastor told me when anybody stands up here and points the finger out there, there's three that point right back this way. This was a study for me that I wanted to share with you. I don't have an excuse to not be perfect anymore. I don't have an excuse to keep those addictions and those things in my life anymore. I need to depend on Jesus, and I need to give that to Jesus, and then make a decision to walk with Jesus. Does that make sense? Amen. I hope you enjoyed the study. Let's, let's all stand and sing our closing hymn, Onward, Christian Soldiers.
heads in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we are so thankful to be able to study your word this morning, Lord. We're so thankful that you granted us safe traveling mercies to be here together. Lord, I believe there's a reason that each one of us were able to study your word this morning. There's a reason why each one of us went through this, this topic this morning, Lord, and, and we're thankful to be able to study together. We pray, Lord, that as we leave this church, that first and foremost, you would help us to keep the Sabbath holy, that you will help us, Lord, to be a good witness to all those around us, that you'll help us to uh, reach out to those that are in need, that you'll help us to continue to study your word as this day goes on. And Lord, we're also thankful that you've revealed to us that each one of us has the power to be like you. Each one of us has it at our very fingertips, Lord. Each one of us has the strength and the will to be like you. We only lack the ability to make the decision. And so, Lord, it's our prayer this morning that you will help each and every one of us to make the decision to leave our sin behind and follow you. Lord, help us to make that decision. Help us to fight with every cell in our body as we would fight to save our lives in this church if it were burning. Help us to fight to save our lives for salvation, Lord. <clears throat> help us to let go of the devil. Help us to let go of the sins that we enjoy. Help us to realize, Lord, that there is so much more to this life and so much more in the life that awaits us than the temporary pleasures of this world that the devil has given us. Help us, Lord, to study your word, to understand what things are in our lives are sins. Many of us, Lord, we commit sin of ignorance where we don't even know that those things are wrong. Help us to study your word diligently, to know these truths, to know what's wrong, Lord, and then give us the strength to let go of those things, to turn from our sin, to have a true sorrow from it and true repentance and follow you. Please bless us as we depart. Please be with us as we keep your Sabbath holy. And thank you, Lord, again for this wonderful blessing to be together on this beautiful day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sabbath. <laughs> 